Hi, this is Erin and Simon with Assets and Arbitrage. And today we have a fantastic show about the silver crisis. You guys know we are precious metals enthusiasts and we really want to drive some very important factors home with you guys. So we have a very important guest with us in SME. Yeah, so we have a, a subject matter expert. Mm -hmm. um, he is the CEO of Miles Franklin. Um, as, as our good friend, uh, uh, from Arcadia Economics would say he is the James Bond of <laughs> silver. Yes. Right. So we have James Bond on here, man. So we gotta <laughs> we're gonna top up some good game with him. You know, we're gonna go to some technical things and some some more you know structural and uh, just the lower level things. So uh, I'll let you start. Um. So today's show, guys, we're gonna be talking about product shortages, premium increases, mm -hmm. delays on inventory buyback promotions, mm -hmm. manipulation in the market, as well as rehypothecation. Um, Andy, the first question I want to um, ask is, since our audience is mainly crypto, we notice that people don't seem to either understand or they may not be aware of the benefits of owning precious metals. It's either crypt all crypto or all precious metals. It's like they're scared to kind of do both. Can you just give them some insight on how important ownership of precious metals is? Yeah, I think it's a mistake. First of all, thanks for having me here. I appreciate it. Um, I always like to expand into the crypto sphere because I think in, in many ways, we're all really in search of the same thing. Well, let me, let me say that a little bit differently. I think cryptocurrencies have great volatility. We've seen that today with the downside, and we've seen that over the last several years with the upside. There is great volatility, and with great volatility comes great opportunity and also with some risk. But what, let's say, Bitcoin was born from was the same type of ideology that I look to precious metals to, and that is uh, decentralization, uh, the removal of counterparty risk, uh, a way out of the system um, that is and has been destroyed or is being destroyed right in front of our eyes by the Federal Reserve, who is destroying the value of the U.S. dollar. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't have to be a one or the other. In fact, I have always felt that the best way to win in, in any investment, and maybe even in particular in cryptocurrencies, is to imagine that you're playing blackjack. And, you know, I have a friend who I would travel with a lot when our children were younger. And as, as families, our two families would travel. And we oftentimes, when we put the kids to bed, Ted and I would end up at a casino, either in the hotel we were staying at or one down the street. And Every single time we played, he won. And I never understood it because I, I sat at the tables with him the whole time. I couldn't have been drinking that much. But he always had a pocket full of chips at the end of the night. And I remember saying to him, Ted, how the hell did you do that? I, I didn't see you win any big hands. He said, ah, but what you didn't notice was that every single hand I did win, I put a green chip in my pocket. Now, the theory here is that if you don't take some profits, if you don't pull money off the table, you never walk away a winner. This is why casinos continue to go higher and higher and higher, because it's exhilarating to watch the chip stack grow. But if you really want to win, you have to take some of those chips and put them in your pocket. And I think transitioning profits from cryptocurrencies into precious metals, which have outlived two world wars, German hyperinflation, every pandemic there has ever been and every financial calamity that there ever has been or we haven't even seen yet, gold and silver are immutable wealth that I think going back to biblical times, um, kings and queens and pharaohs and emperors and you name it, have always owned gold and silver as a form of immutable wealth. Now, cryptocurrencies and the technology behind it are something new and something exciting and very, very well may be something revolutionary and highly enriching. But by the same token, I think there's something to be said for an asset class that has outlived everything else. And in the year 3000, when 
the dollar bills that your and my wallet are hanging from a frame in the Smithsonian as a, a sample of what was gold and silver will still be immutable wealth that your great grandchildren could use and would have significance. And it's proven that. So I don't discount what Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies represent. I understand there's opportunity. There's also that doesn't come without a modicum of risk, but the way to minimize and mitigate that risk is when you make some profits, pick a number, 10%, 20%, whatever it is, pull it out and put it in the time-tested historical tool of wealth preservation, that being gold and silver, which to me is not an investment nor a speculation, but it is wealth. Wealth that I hope I don't ever have to use. And that doesn't just mean I guess a, a, an emergency could be an opportunity where I'm glad I have it if I have to use it. If not, I pass it on to my children and knowing that it will represent something will never go to zero. And that's the way that I look at gold and silver, you guys. It's not an either or for me. It, it, it should be a complement to cryptocurrencies because we're all in search of the same thing. And that is a little bit of privacy, uh, a little bit of utility, um, something that is not going to be destroyed by the printing press and the whims of our Federal Reserve. So to me, it's not all or none. It should be a little bit of both. Mm. Awesome. Okay. So with that being said, let's jump right to the crisis part. So we've been keeping the audience updated about what's been going on in the London, in the London bullion mint and how the silver has been decreasing. If you could talk to us about the current COMEX crisis and the manipulation of the silver market, just to give our audience, because you are an insider, right? You do it on such a high level that you can give us insight that we can't necessarily get from media. Sure, so when you talk about the drawdowns on the exchanges, this is something that is very eye-opening to me. There is a disconnection between the price and the demand and at the highest, highest levels. And, and when we talk about the amount of metal that is leaving the exchanges, it's truly extraordinary. In the past 18 months, 70% of all the silver in the registered category on the COMEX market is gone. Um, over the past year and a half, we've seen major drawdowns on COMEX and backdooring out of the ETFs, in particular SLV, where the authorized participants, largely the commercial banks, have privately withdrawn millions and millions and millions of ounces out of the ETFs, out of SLV in particular. We've seen major drawdowns on, on COMEX and on the London Metals Exchange, as you mentioned, to where on the LME, it they, rep, they have the smallest amount of inventory that they've ever had since they started keeping records in 2016. When we talk about gold on the COMEX market one month ago, in one day, 25 million ounces of gold in the kilo bar form, which backs the mini contract on COMEX off roughly 45% of all the kilo bars on one day. Who's got that kind of bread to buy 25 million ounces of gold? And it left the ecosystem, which I'll talk about in a moment, uh, one day, 10 days ago or so, 5% of all the 100 ounce gold bars were delivered in one day. 5%, you're talking millions of ounces, gone in one day. Who has this kind of money? The country of India is, is uh, projected to import over 300 million ounces of silver this year. That's roughly a third of global mine production in one year. The London Metals Exchange, which delivered 45 million ounces of silver in September. If we see that kind of pace of continuing delivery, which you can do off of the exchanges, by mid 2023, they'll be completely and totally out of silver. When we talk about the COMEX, if you take all of the silver in the vaults of which the majority of it is in what's called the eligible category, those are bars that are owned by companies like mine or hedge funds or businesses that have, or, or personal, um, holdings of people or companies that have really no intention of selling it. It is just within the COMEX ecosystem, which is important because if it's inside the ecosystem, even if it's never really going to be sold, the liquidity that you have 
is extraordinary, where if Elon Musk, Musk said, I'll pay a $50 an ounce premium for everyone who's got silver in COMEX that wants to sell it, you could immediately transfer it out of your eligible account into his without any uh, delay because they're, they're assayed and verified within the COMEX ecosystem. What's very unusual about what we're seeing here is all of this silver and all of this gold is being delivered out of the ecosystem. But if you take all of the bars that are eligible to be delivered, which are called registered, um, against the number of contracts that are, are out there right now that could stand for delivery, it is 1,850% what's called rehypothecated or 1,850% more paper contracts than there are bars backing the largest price setting mechanism of the world, the COMEX market. If you take all of the silver, including the eligible category, which aren't for delivery, which aren't for sale, they're in strong hands and they do not belong to the COMEX, they're just inside of the ecosystem. It's almost 300% more paper than bars, meaning on the first example, just the bars that are available for delivery, one out of 18 gets their bars, the rest get paper settled. If you take all of the silver of which the majority is not for sale, one out of three gets their bars, everyone else gets screwed or paper settled. So when you talk about what is happening, where I take, comfort in knowing what is coming down the pike is that the, 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 the most wealthy, the most influential, well-funded, uh, closest to the information, sophisticated traders on the globe are draining the supply from the top on down to where the London Metals Exchange literally has the lowest amount of inventory they've ever had, where the COMEX market has witnessed a 70% drawdown in the last 18 months, where uh, 18 months ago, there was somewhere in the neighborhood of 120 million ounces in the registered category, and now there is only about 34 million ounces. It is disappearing right in front of our eyes. And the biggest money in the world is using the levered, manipulated price of gold and silver to run cover for massive acquisition. When you see it leaving the ecosystem, where it now has lost all liquidity, it tells you it's a one-way street. It is never coming back. There was an article written by Bloomberg and Reuters a week ago talking about mysterious gold whales, where the US has exported 400 tons of gold in this, this year, uh, or excuse me, in this quarter, the third quarter of 2022, 400 tons, which is double, nearly double the, the um, highest delivery month in the third quarter ever where it's nearly, when you look at the number of ounces that have been delivered since the entire year, it's already greater than the greatest year ever in central bank deliveries going all the way back to 1967 and there's still a few weeks left in the year. So the central banks and the commercial banks and the sovereign wealth funds and the family offices, the people who not only got all the bread, but they're also closest to the information are using the suppressed price to literally drain COMEX, LME, and all of the ETFs. It's the no look pass in basketball. It is complete and total misdirection. You're trying to fake everyone out over there when this is where you're going. It's like in any game or in any sport, misdirection is what you're trying to do to the opponent. And that is exactly what the big money is doing here by manipulating the paper price and taking copious deliveries in what is highly unusual. Never saw these kind of deliveries before. And right now, literally the, the, the cupboards are being stripped bare while the manipulated price has everyone else looking elsewhere, not noticing what's happening. Mm. And it's not really being reported in the media the way that you're able to just kind of give us the details and show us how all the pieces fit in the drawdown. Yeah, it's not being reported in the media and, and quite to the contrary, just about everything that is important these days. Many of the things that I've been talking about for two years, three years, which are now gaining a lot of notoriety throughout the industry have yet to be addressed or spoken about in any real fashion 
uh, whatsoever. I have talked about the BRICS nations for the last few years and, and the rise of them and how they are beginning to coalesce against the West and accumulate all the commodities they have issued or said they are issuing a new world reserve currency that will be pegged to commodities in all of the countries, Brazil, Russia, China, India, South Africa, and the newly uh, joined Saudi Arabia, which is a huge deal because it is the protected protection of Saudi Arabia and of OPEC that gives the dollar its world reserve status. We who are moving away from the combustion engine where President Biden just told the Paris Accord members that we are sorry for leaving the Paris Accord, that we are going to rejoin, that we are going to um, uh, continue to, to move away from fossil fuels and we will uh, in fact pay $20 billion to developing nations for the amount of pollution that the big bad US does uh, the decisions that we are making are incentivizing Saudi Arabia and OPEC to move away from us. I have talked about this ad nauseum for a few years, and, and it's interesting. It hasn't been brought up at all in the mainstream. The closest I saw to it was just recently with this story about the big gold wills, which talked about 400 tons of gold being shipped out in the third quarter, of which 120 tons were verified. 280 tons weren't. Two thirds of all the gold shipped, they had no idea who bought it, but the, they surmise in the Bloomberg article and in Reuters that it's China, Russia, Saudi Arabia, and India. Now, where have we heard those names before? Oh yeah, BRICS. The <laughs> BRICS nations are moving against the West and they are doing so by accumulating the world's commodities. And they are going to issue a commodity backed currency. They've told us they're gonna do that. Saudi Arabia just joined BRICS. All, all of the countries are on the Belt Road Initiative, which is the largest infrastructure project in human history that China has embarked upon for a few years ago that no one in this country talks about. It's happening right in front of our eyes. These are huge changes that are coming upon us. And I think people really need to, to start digging a little bit, stop using the mainstream as their source of information or they're going to be caught completely flat-footed and blindsided by what's coming after us. Mm. Well, I had a question. I was going to pivot a little bit. Uh, I just wanted to ask about something you said that I, I always found very intriguing. You, you probably said it uh, maybe a, a couple years ago. Uh, I am a scientist, a chemist, mm -hmm. and you said that silver will be the first element struck from the periodic table. And I just would like to hear more about that. Well, there, there is an agency of the US government, a geological branch of the US government that more or less came out and said in their estimation, it would be the first element struck from the periodic table of elements. For 5,000 years, the ratio of gold to silver mined in the Earth's crust was 16 to one. It is now uh, fall into seven to one. And in geologic terms, silver is found in a form called epithermal, very near the surface. So the big deposits were discovered long ago. And so in fact, of, of roughly 850 million ounces that are mined each year, um, only roughly 35% of that, roughly 250 million ounces come from companies that specifically mine silver. The rest of it, 65% or over a half a million ounces come from companies that have no business whatsoever of mining silver, they just stumble across it. What that tells me is when you see an asset that is depleting in nature, where it's so hard to find that only a third of all the silver mine comes from companies specifically looking for it, where the other two thirds comes from people who just trip over it. Oh, here's some as they're mining for zinc or lead or gold or copper. Um, it's, it's an asset that is disappearing. And what makes it even more of a, of a quandary is the need for silver is what's called inelastic, meaning you need it if you want an Apple iPhone, if you want to look at a flat screen computer monitor that you and I are both looking at, if you want to have solar panels, or if you want to have anything that's digital or electronic, anything that is green, batteries, all of this stuff needs copious amounts of silver. So not just the monetary renaissance that we've seen over the last several years, but the industrial applications that are growing in an environment where the geologic footprint is, is, is disappearing. So it's an interesting issue where you have increased demand and decreased supply, not only above ground, but also below ground, 
uh, setting up for what could be the first element struck from the periodic table. Now, I know that's quite a big statement, especially for someone who of your understanding of, of um, you know, elements and whatnot, but that was indeed something that was said, and I forgot the exact name, but it's like the United States Government Geological Survey Society, something along those lines, or several years ago, this was a, a, um, a statement that they made, and quite frankly, I don't have a hard time believing it, as it appears, at least on the above ground supply, to literally be disappearing and into strong hands and off of the exchanges, removing any and all counterparty risk, you put it together with the depletion in above ground supply from a mining side of things to the disappearing of all the investable assets. It's, it's really becoming an asset that's becoming not quite unobtainium yet, but it seems to be moving in that direction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I always got questions. I got a ton of questions. So, so I also wanted to ask, uh, you know, just... When I when I got into the silver game uh, from the people I talked to, they always told me, you know, it, uh, build your stack, you know, build up your uh, ounces. And then, you know, once I felt like I had built the ounces up that, and I felt comfortable, I liked that I went into numismatics and um, what I like to call the, the low, uh, what were those coins? The low mintage. Low mintage mm -hmm. coins. Thank you. And uh, so what would be your advice for uh, people just jumping in the game? Um, you know, uh, with what's available, what's available now, what, what would be your advice to them to get started? I think you envision a hot fudge Sunday. <laughs> Those low mintages are, would be things that you could call sprinkles or, or cherries on mm -hmm. top. You don't fill a bowl with sprinkles and cherries and then pour just a, a little spoonful of ice cream upon it. I think right. the way to do it is to build a big bowl of vanilla ice cream first. And then if you want to throw some hot fudge and some sprinkles and even a cherry or two, great. There's your, your, um, your numismatics, your things that have potential. Numismatics is a term for your listeners who may not know what that means, where your, the value of the coin is more related to its scarcity or its rarity than it is its uh, content. I think in the end, it's about number of ounces that matter without being penny wise and pound foolish because you're always better off having a thousand one ounce rounds versus a thousand ounce bar, uh, 10 hundred ounce bars versus a thousand ounce bar, a uh, uh, hundred ten ounce bars versus, uh, um, or, or rather 10 10 ounce bars versus one 100 ounce bar or a hundred one ounce rounds. You can never be too flexible, but in the end, it's about the number of ounces that matter. And numismatics and collectibles are, I think, dependent upon the motivation that you're looking for. So, you know, I think most people nowadays are looking to protect themselves from what's coming. And I would stay away from numismatics because you're buying something that has intrinsic value above and beyond the, the melt value, has the value that is um, given to it because of its scarcity or its rarity. So it lacks the maybe the liquidity or the demand that people would be looking for in this environment. That's not to say there's anything wrong with it, but I think it should be after you've got that bowl of vanilla ice cream firmly in place. Mm, okay. So basically little by little, yeah, get, get the, the ounces, um, get the constitutional silver, Right, Not, then you can go to your ASCs, your Philharmonics, your Maple Leafs, yeah, your Cougarans. Then you can move on to your art. Now, events. the coins behind me, right here. Oh, sorry, it's backwards. <laughs> those are Morgan silver dollars. Okay, and those are, are dollar, those were dollars minted in the US uh, from the late 1870s to 1904, and then no dollars were minted until from 05 to 1920. In 21, they picked up again. They made the Morgan for a half a year, and then they made the piece from 21 to 36. And then they stopped making silver dollars in this country. And any of the silver dollars you've ever seen subsequent 1936, with the exception of the Silver Eagle, which isn't the currency, um, don't have silver in it. So those, to me, and you can see they're certified, to me, are a better choice than a low mintage, modern minted coin. Um, and I think it's 
it's a true rarity when you're buying something 100 plus years old where people had no idea to keep it in good condition because it was legal tender. And so that to me, if I'm buying a collectible is where I would go. The modern minted stuff, basically in many respects, you have dealers out there that will prey upon the public because they create a story where there really isn't one. Let me explain. Um, if you opened up a box of Silver Eagles and you sent it, there's 500 coins and you sent it into PCGS, 470 of them will come back MS69 and 30 will come back MS70, something like that, right? So they're all super high grade. And in these, these are MS63s. If you found one in an MS69, it would be in the Smithsonian worth, I don't know, a million dollars. So it's a situation where that is a true rarity based upon real metrics. Whereas a coin that was minted by a government, a modern minted coin that is just easily sent into a grading service and they grade it and call it a high grade and said it had a small mintage. Yeah, there's something to it. But when you talk about real rarity, real scarcity, to me, that's what those are. Um, and if I were going to be buying numismatics, I personally would focus on the older items first and foremost, because there are companies out there that are less than genuine about the story they're telling about modern minted coins. And I will tell you, there have been plenty of times where I was low on gold eagles um, for clients. And I have half, you know, 500 MS 69s that we bought from someone. I'll sell them to a client, those MS69 PCGS first strike gold eagles, and I will not charge them any more than if it was a raw gold eagle in a tube. It's a story that is being told by a lot of the dealers. Now there are some modern minted coins, MS70s and some, some really neat things that are truly worth it. But from my perspective, uh, if you're going to buy anything that is not bullion related and you want to buy numismatic coins, I would stick with the pre-1933 gold and either the Morgan and the Peace silver dollars, which would be either pre-1904 or 1921 to 1936. You'll be glad you did. Mm. Yeah, yes, <laughs> indeed. Yes, indeed. <laughs> and, you know, and something else I wanted to ask you, because I was talking to somebody about this the other day. Um, when I got into the silver game, you know, it was about stacking ounces, you know, getting the ounces. I would get the 10 ounce bars and we cut a couple, couple kilo bars and stuff. And then it became almost like a hobby, like coin collecting. Yep. Like we would like to collect coins and, and, and it became and we get our children involved and they want to get a Marvel coin or mm -hmm. DC Comics, Disney, something like that. So uh, how would you say that about, you know, as somebody maybe further in the um, silver game who, who has their ounces stacked up and they're just collecting coins at this point? I mean, that's, that's kind of the neat thing about it is that what starts out as an investment can turn into a hobby, very much so. And teaching kids about sound money is fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, and look, I mean, it's been wealth for 5,000 years. So to explain that to them and teach them about it, that, that you know, someone had to dig this out of the ground and refine it and turn it into this, it wasn't just created with a keystroke. It's huge. But I think there is no question about it. I mean, anyone who accumulates enough gold and silver will get bit by that bug where you, you know, you're intrigued by other things and you collect them and build sets. And great. I mean, that's part of it. That there's no question about it. But I will tell you this. The companies out there that are selling backdated Eagles and Maple Leafs and Krugerrands at premiums, mm -hmm. that's not right either. I will sell backdated stuff at a discount. So here again, these are companies that are making stories where there isn't a story. I am a big fan of collecting and building sets, but do it the right way. Talk to someone who gives you the right information, doesn't charge you too much, because if you have a set, for example, the Silver Eagles, you can get, they've, they've been made since 1986. I have three sets of MS69 Silver Eagles that I buy for my three kids. I bought every year, I buy three MS69 Silver Eagles. 
Um, and that's a set you can reasonably acquire from 86 to 2022. And in that grouping, there's really one key date, the 1996, that will cost you more money. A couple, maybe the 2021 Type 1, mm -hmm. before they switch to the Type 2. There are a few coins that will charge you more money, but this is a set that you can reasonably acquire. And I think it has greater value than just having the same number of Silver Eagles because of the set, the composition makes it great. So um, yeah, I think it's part of the game. And, and if you get enjoyment out of building it into a collection, not just intrinsic wealth, but also a hobby and in something you get enjoyment out of, yeah, why not? I think it's great. And it happens to a lot of people. Yes, indeed. And I'm just, I'll just i say this, I'll just say this and then we move on. Um, probably one of my my favorite coins that I have is um, I'm a Cincinnati Bengals fan. Oh gosh! So um, <laughs> so I went and bought the official um, coin that they flip at the Super Bowl. So it has a big, you know, and they get a nice certification. It was only in its low mint, it's uh, 2021 minted, and I got a, a nice paper. But you know, that's one of my favorite coins. I would never sell it. You know, I keep I keep it displayed on my desk in my office and stuff like that. That's my one of my favorite coins. It's not a uh, oh gosh, she brought me. I was gonna bring. I was gonna yeah, take it off the wall. But yeah, and I have a whole a plaque with the, with the silver coins on mm -hmm. it. Uh, on the road to the Super Bowl, so that's that stuff. This that's where it makes it gets interesting. Where it's just, I'm just collecting right there. You know, I'm gonna get yeah, my. Well, and that's my that's great. And there's no protocol or or set criteria one needs to employ. Mm -hmm. And if you get enjoyment out of it, great. I think that's fantastic. And um, maybe they could rub some silver on Jamar Chase's hip so he can get back because my fantasy <laughs> team is dying without him. Uh, I, I look. I think I think it's very cool, and that's one of the neat things about precious metals. And and it it, it you have possession of it. In tr you have it in your possession. There's there's the removal of counterparty risk and collecting and having it in your possession is something that's neat. And you know when I started my company with my father uh, 33 years ago, I was 19 years old and. He told me there'd be one rule and only one rule or he'd fire me. I said, well, okay, I can deal with that. What, what's your, your one rule, dad? He says, you'll buy something every two weeks or you're fired. Well, I've owned the company outright for 20 years. He's still my partner in many respects and certainly still my dad. Mm -hmm. I've honored my word to him for 33 years. I have never missed a two week period ever. It's to me, it's not an investment even remotely, it's wealth. And there have been ways that I have collected it and accumulated it that I great, get great enjoyment out of that I hope someday my kids do too. But again, I buy all of this as wealth, not as an investment. And um, it, it very well may and has performed like a damn good investment, but that's not what my motivation is. My motivation is we are living in a period of time where the, the, the currency that we call money is being destroyed. And mm -hmm and where the, the mismanagement and manipulation of interest rates has created such distortions in the economy and in the world that um, there's going to be a price to pay as rates rise because all of these assets that are improperly valued against super low interest rates will have a, a religious experience when they find equilibrium between their value and interest rates. Case in point, I moved from Minneapolis where I grew up and spent 50 years of my life a year and a half ago to Delray Beach, Florida, where I'm at now. Uh -huh. And when I bought my home here, I decided to take out a mortgage because it, the rates were so attractive, 3% for a 30 year mortgage. What are they now? Seven and a half percent. So as rates rise and the rates have only risen by 2% or so on the federal funds rate, which created double that rise in the 30 year mortgage. What happens if, you know, Bullard from, I think it's St. Louis Fed came out and said rates should be 7%. Well, if the federal fund rate is at 7%, where does that put the 30 year mortgage? 12, 13, what happens to the real estate market? What happens to the bond market? All those bonds were sold at lower interest rates. And where are those bonds? Well, they're inside of pension funds. They're inside of insurance company portfolios. They're inside of, of 
manage money portfolios where Wall Street has lived, lived under the 60-40 mantra forever, 60% stocks, 40% bonds. Well, at what point as rates rise and those bonds are getting eviscerated, do the hedge funds and the insurance companies and the pension funds that all have to, to uh, answer to their constituents, what, what happens when this, they, they have to just sell? Um, it's gonna happen. And I think you're going to see rates continue to rise. And so this is an environment where it's really very important to look at gold and silver as wealth. Now, you'll get enjoyment out of it. Sure, you can buy the Marvel coins or you know, mm-hmm. the painted coins or the Cincinnati Bengal coins, whatever, but it's still wealth. And when chips are down and dollars are not wanted, you have tangible wealth in an environment where assets will feed you and liabilities will eat you. The wealthy people in this world accumulate assets. And that is exactly what gold and silver are. It's wealth and it's an asset in your control away from counterparty risk. And they are really two of the only assets in the world that are not simultaneously someone else's liability. The only liability you have in owning gold and silver is not getting it ripped off. And that's about it. And uh, okay, that, man, that's that's great, and and that leads right into what I want to talk about. Uh, we talk to a lot of people, uh, maybe the underserved communities, um, people who uh, keep a lot of their wealth in um, in in their home ownership. But I always talk about gold and silver being wealth and offsetting people who may not be able to own their home. And I say, hey, you know, but you can own this wealth, right? You know, if you, if you have to be a renter and, and things like that, uh, how, how would you see that if you're not uh, able to own your home, but offsetting your non-owner homeownership with uh, building wealth? Again, it's all about assets, accumulate mm-hmm. assets, minimize liabilities. You know, you have to live somewhere and, and a house affordability is the lowest it's ever been right now because House prices haven't come down very much yet. Rates have gone way up. So the affordability of the house is already high and the cost of money has doubled. And there was an article I just read that said, if you're not making over a hundred thousand bucks, you're pretty much screwed in terms of getting a house in the States nowadays, or at least one that won't render you completely broke each month or, or overextended. Um, and so again, you accumulate what you can when you can it's not about how much it's about how much you can accumulate yourself not how many ounces that you should have it's just what can you afford and the nice thing about precious metals is that when you put it away it takes a modicum of effort to sell it back to someone or a company Mm -hmm. like mine It, it isn't easily just frivolously pissed away and that can happen with you know, let's say you give your, your 12 year old 200 bucks. And, you know, I know when I was 12 years old, $200 was literally going to evaporate in the palm of my <laughs> hand within, you know, a day. And whatever I bought it on or spent it on, rather, it was the most important thing in the world. But, you know, when you're 12, who knows? So the point of it is, is that my well, my kids, for example, three kids that I had, when they would have birthday parties or go to birthday parties, I always gave them a proof silver eagle as gifts instead of you know toys. And and you know, silver was much lower; it was a lot easier to do, and uh, or just a regular silver eagle. And and they always hated it until now. They all come up to me, Mr. Sheckman. I I love. I have seven of those silver coins that I got through the years from all the birthday parties that your son came to of mine. Oh, thank you so much. And it's, it's wealth and they still have it. And they're 22 years old, but they were getting it from the time they were six, seven, eight, nine, 10, and 11. And a decade later, they still have it because it isn't like, you know, opening up your wallet or, or going to the ATM or putting it on your debit card. It just sits in a drawer somewhere and yeah, you could go sell it, but it's not, as easy as it is selling or just using cash. So I I think to answer your question, assets feed you, liabilities eat you. It doesn't matter if you're buying one ounce a week or two 
Uh, it doesn't matter if you're buying 100 ounces or 1,000 ounces every other week. Buy what you can afford and put it away and get on a um, pattern of paying yourself first. That's the best gift my father ever gave me. And we come from nothing. I mean, we started the Franklin and Miles Franklin. My dad's middle name is Miles. His best friend is Franklin, who loaned us $60,000 in 1989 to start this company. Uh, in a one-room office, is half the, a tenth of the size of the room that you're in right now, closet size, and we just eclipsed eight billion dollars. And the my dad knew well enough to tell me one rule or only one rule, and that is you'll buy something every two weeks. He was telling me, pay yourself first, always. You will never get ahead if you don't. There's always something that you need to spend it on. But you know what? If you're thirty back, bucks short of that bill this month and, and you owe 300 bucks and you send them 270 and you buy yourself an ounce of silver with a little note saying, I'll catch up with you next month. At least you're getting, you're paying down your debt, but you're paying yourself first. And I can't stress how important that is uh, because, you know, you guys are old enough to know, you know, you blink your eyes and you're not 17 anymore, but you still feel that way in your brain. But where did all the time go? Now you got kids and responsibilities and I got to save. Well, I don't have time to save it. Yes, you do. You pay yourself first always. And the best way to do it in my mind is precious metals, not only because it's been wealth for 5,000 years, but because it's a little bit more challenging. Granted, it's very liquid, but it's not as liquid as a debit card or cash in your wallet. It takes a little bit of effort. Great way to put money away because you wake up and all of a sudden you're 40 or you're 50 and wow, I've saved a lot. I've been buying every two weeks for 33 years. Well, not everyone's gonna say that, but there is no better time to start than right now. And it doesn't matter how much you can buy, buy what you can. Mm, definitely. So, so what I would, would like to ask is, this is what a lot of people ask me about. And we've been silver investors, physical silver investors for many, many years. It's about, um, what would you say? Um, taking care of your silver, but security of your silver, oh, yeah, protecting. protecting your silver, your physical silver. No, we have talked offline about that. Uh, we, we, we brought a, a, an amount of silver down to Mexico. You know, you have to secure it. Um, you you know, pay the <laughs> yeah, we, we go on vacation sometimes, but we take the whole family and we take the, we got like a, a, a you know, amount it's of silver, we, we bring it with us. You know, so what, what would you say about the, uh, the protection of silver, physical it's, silver? It's the one liability. Any... It's the one liability. Yeah. That you don't tell anyone about it. You keep it secret. You hide it. Dig a hole in your backyard. Become a midnight gardener. Um, I think you have a greater chance of being ripped off by the system than you do of having someone find and steal your silver. Now, again, you're in a different country. You're in a different situation. And it's interesting, it doesn't matter what country you're in or what language they speak, everyone knows what silver is, everyone. You could be in the middle of the, the jungle in Africa. You could be on the Bahnhofstrasse in Zurich. You could be in, in, in the Kremlin in, in Russia. You could be in, in Beijing. It doesn't matter where you are, you hold up a silver coin. Oh, silver, I know what that is, plata, whatever they call it. But uh, it's recognized. But I don't think you have to worry if you keep it quiet, loose lips sink ships, don't tell your friends. I mean, I know you want to, but show them one silver coin, don't tell them how much you have and hide it, hide it well. Let make sure someone knows where it's hidden. Um, but a PVC pipe capped with rubber caps on both ends, buried two feet down vertically, not horizontally, will evade just about any metal detector on the planet. Sounds crazy, but you can go get a big plant that you have, a potted plant that you put in the corner of your room, lift it up and put all the silver underneath it and put the pot and the dirt back down. I mean, you can get creative. You can pry open, I see two stairs behind you, you can pry open the floorboard on those stairs or their stone might be tougher, but if it were wood, pry it open, put it back there, shut it, hide it. And like I said, you have a greater chance of being ripped off by the system than you do. Um, by someone assuming that you have silver in your possession. 
Yeah, and and, and we we ran into a problem, um, and, and so we we rectified that. But but we you know we have um, a YouTube channel. We go over some of the silver pieces and talk about the things we have. But then it it comes out you know like oh you have a lot of silver, mm -hmm. and people will start you know mentioning like oh you got a lot of silver. And I said well maybe we shouldn't show the silver piece we're just talking about the pieces why we bought them the with, portfolio with the portfolio and so and then people you know get hit to the fact that you have it and then so you know you definitely got to put it away and, and uh exactly. carry it with you and most of our silver is in the um what was that place the uh depository, depository. but uh we do keep silver physical silver with us uh, you know, so the kids can see it, so they can. Because um, it's really, it's really theirs, right? The silver's not for us, Andy. We buy the silver for the children, mm -hmm. and we tell them it's not for you either. It's for your children. Mm -hmm. That way, each generation can keep telling the next generation it's for the next person. And that's the right. You're giving them the right information, and you're you're explaining to them what it really is. It's wealth that will live through the generations. That is immutable, and it's an important lesson. And look, people like you and people like me are different. We're out there. People see who we are. Most people won't have to worry about that. But a depository is a good one, a good choice. Just make sure you choose the right depositories. And we have great ones in North America with Brinks. We have a great storage program. But it's a, it's a fair question, you guys. But um, I would just simply say you hide it best you can when you reach a point where you no longer feel comfortable you send it to a depository. And um, again, remember, it's one of the few assets in the world that is not simultaneously someone else's liability. When it's held at a depository, that statement is slightly altered. So keep what you can, hide it, don't tell people. And um, when you reach that point of losing sleep at night, it's time to move some to the depository. Okay. Okay, definitely. So another question I get from people all the time, um, they always ask why we talk about buying silver more than buying gold. And I just give them the silver to gold ratio. I try to explain that, um, you know, quickly. And uh, it, so, and like you said, it's coming out of ground seven to one, the silver to gold ratio is about 90 to one. Um, and I always just tell them, you know, when would you tell people it would be a good time in the silver to gold ratio to start maybe buying gold? Because I know you're a gold. It gets near 42 to one, which has been the 200 year average. Okay. It's averaged for the last 200 years, about 42 to one. It's only been at this level, less than 1% of the time over the last hundred years. And it's a, it's a anomaly in price or in ratio. Um, the fact that gold was reclassified the world's only other tier one reserve asset by the Bank of International Settlements three years ago tells me that ultimately we want to probably be in gold, but we use this ratio, which is a generational opportunity uh, to get more gold. And it happened in, in 2010, just like this, where I noticed an 85 to one ratio, do a little digging, find out at that point, it's the second time in human history it's ever been that way. I had been doing public speaking at conventions to this point for years, but um, I start getting invited on YouTubes like yours, and I start talking in 2010, telling people, if you own gold, switch it to silver right now. I said, at 85 to 1, we've only been here twice in human history. This is an anomaly. Anyone who would have traded their, their gold to silver then would have received 85 ounces of silver in theory, minus the premiums. <laughs> and... Um, Seven months later, we, re we regressed to the mean past 42 to one, which is the 200 year average to 37 to one, just like that. Anyone who would have then switched back to gold would have only needed 37 ounces of gold or silver to get one ounce of gold when they traded one for 85. So they would have well over doubled what they started with in seven months. And I think that's what you can expect to see here too. We will regress to the mean. Um, you know, when you talk about 80 plus to one where we are right now, that's four feet of snow in Mexico in July. It's an anomaly. You wouldn't go out and buy a snowmobile, you know, if that happened, if you woke up to four feet of snow out your door, you would know, well, what the heck's going on? This would probably, let's go make snow angels with the kids because it's going to be gone in an hour. So that's an anomaly. Same thing in the historical context and a geological context where we are right now. So anytime it gets near 40-ish to one, I would start strongly considering at least trading some 
even though it's coming out of the ground at seven to one, pigs get fat and hogs get slaughtered. So I would say 40 ish to one, don't be greedy, start moving that, that back to gold, but you can hold some off in anticipation of it actually going much lower. And it would be logical if it did based upon its geologic footprint. And, um, you know, we're big, uh, we're followers of uh, 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 Mike Maloney, mm -hmm. uh, big followers of Mike Maloney. And, and, and one thing he says is that uh, I think 15 to one is the, the, the rate that, that, that is uh, ideal. Is that, do you agree with that? Well, he says that because the real geologic ratio forever was 15.5 to one. Okay. Um, I mean, I think you could argue it's seven to one. I mean, if, if they're only mining seven ounces for every one ounce of gold, then, you know, in the end, doesn't the availability of what you're able to produce have to come into some sort of alignment with the price? And if not, then it's make-believe. So 15 to one certainly is reasonable when it's coming out of the ground at half that amount. And, um, Keith Neumeyer, CEO of First Majestic Silver, a friend of mine, he's told me that personally and publicly, where he's saying, look, you know, this is what's coming out of the ground. Believe it or not, globally, the, the mining companies are, are pulling out one ounce of gold for every seven ounces of silver that they pull out. This is a, this is a, a uh, over almost a 60% haircut from what it has been geologically since the beginning of time. So it's depleting. So whether you choose seven to one or 15 to one or 40 to one, 40 to one representing 200 years worth of price history, 15 and a half to one representing 5,000 years worth of geologic history, seven to one representing the new geologic reality. So pick your number, but here again, you know, um, a double ain't so bad and anything beyond that, not only is it possible, mathematically it's 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 beyond possible i think there's even a, a chance of probable that we see it go past 40 to 1 ultimately because at some point when you realize all the silver that is used in industry is destroyed it's in landfills or in the tip of a tomahawk cruise missile or on the back of a motherboard somewhere just tiny little bits of it it's gone forever so it's a depleting asset, not only in terms of its above ground stockpile because of its industrial applications, but in below ground as well. So from every single metric, it's as good of an investment, even though I don't call it an investment, but it is, it checks all the boxes for being one hell of an investment based upon demand, supply, dwindling supply, and geologic and price uh, ratios that go back five uh, five thousand years. Yeah, and I want to big big shout out to Keith Newmeyer. We're big investors in uh, First Majestic Justin. Silver. Mm -hmm. um, they have mine out here in Mexico. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's in, in Dorado, the Dorado on the mm -hmm. west coast of the Mexico. But um, yeah, definitely. I mean, I we always follow Keith and I mean, Keith Newmeyer. He, he he gives us great information. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sorry. I didn't, Wanted you to ask your question. I just, oh I've no, because we just pivoted so far away from it. I was going to ask him about. Um, well, know. we we talked about the physical aspect of silver. Mm -hmm. um, Simon's the silver guy in the house, um, but he's also the I like to call him the macroeconomist. So, in the last two shows we've watched with you, and this will be our last question, Andy. We do honor your time. Um, you talked about gold being a U.S. tier one asset. You have the central banks purchasing. We have the reported and the unreported being purchased by mystery whales. We talked about Turkey's unprecedented purchases. You mentioned that China was the biggest importer and producer of gold. I wanted you to talk a little bit about Enbridge. You brought it up on Dr. Kaya Pruitt's show. And I was so like, wow, because again, it's information we're not reading in any article on the net. So if you could just quickly just kind of talk about that new world order that you've been talking about on several shows, I would really appreciate that. Uh, the Embridge is a, was a test that was um, uh, done recently between uh, China and um, the United Arab Emirates and one other country it'll come to me i think it was thailand i'm pretty sure 
Anyways, it was a trial that processed somewhere in the neighborhood of 150 or 60 payments worth over $22 million, all of it in real time. And it was, it's a bridge, so they call it, that allows the uh, transferring, if you will, of central bank digital currencies cross-border. So all three of these countries were simulating cross-border payments in different central bank digital currencies. And the takeaway from it was not only was it immediate in terms of the clearing without the waiting that you have with SWIFT, um, but more importantly than anything, and it went flawlessly, the most important part of it was that it did so, these payments were all done without the dollar denominated correspondent banking or the SWIFT system. It, it sidestep, sidestep SWIFT, which is what the dollar or what the West uses to impose sanctions. So by weaponizing the dollar against Russia, we have incentivized this type of ingenuity where the rest of the world is saying, are we next? Screw it, let's build our own ecosystem and get away from the West and their ability to, to through hypocrisy and, and tyranny, this is from their perspective, um, you know, um, impose these sanctions and these penalties against us if they don't like what we're doing. And, you know, prime example of it would have been there was a bank in France a few years ago that was uh, levied a $4 billion fine for trading with Iran when they were on the sanction list. Well, they either had to pay it or they were kicked out of SWIFT. Well, if all of these countries start to move away from SWIFT and move away from the Western hegemony, then what good do sanctions do if the rest of the world doesn't care and are using a different system? That's what we have incentivized through our um, through our hypocrisy, through our through our unilateral uh, imposition of these fines and and um, uh, penalties, that has incentivized the world to move away. This embridge is just the very beginning of what I believe will be a concerted effort to move away from SWIFT. And uh, prior to the embridge, you had the Chinese and Russians come up with something called SIPS, which is the Cross Interbank Payment System, which again sidestepping swift so the writing is on the wall and i think it's only a matter of time before you have all of these countries not only join together a, uh, um, uh, fighting against the western hypocrisy and hegemony the glue that will make it all work that that, that hypocrisy and that rallying cry gets them all to the table. The glue will be what the Russian finance minister said is that this new central bank currency that the BRICS are going to issue, he already told us this, will be, will be pegged to commodities. And I believe they will use the central bank digital currency called the um, uh, Chinese digital yuan, which has been in beta testing for the last four years to the tune of over 20 billion in transactions, including the Winter Olympics, where they rolled it out to the public, um, will be the rails by which the new BRICS nation currency exists. Um, and all of the countries involved will peg commodities, and in particular gold, to the ledger for the whole world to see. And it will give it immediate credibility. Um, and I think that's coming. So this is what we can expect to receive, uh, to see. And just the other day in the wake of the, uh, the, the, the crypto collapse uh, that we've seen, uh, the FTX or whatever the name of the company is, we see yesterday that the Fed just announced that they're issuing uh, immediately uh, along with 12, uh, uh, how many banks? It's a 12 week process, I believe that they are doing. And it's um, going to be along with um, a 12 week digital dollar pilot plan that the Federal Reserve Bank just uh, of New York just announced on Tuesday. Citigroup, HSBC, MasterCard, Wells Fargo, uh, New York, uh, Bank of New York, Mellon, um, PNC Financial, uh, TD, Toronto Dominion Bank, Truist Financial, US Bank, they're all going to be part of this new test for the next 12 weeks um, using the new digital Fed dollar. It's coming. Here it comes. And um, 
you, we are entering a new era of central bank digital currencies. We will transition into a cashless society. Having precious metals has never been more important and uh, for various reasons, but um, I think it's just beginning. Mm. <laughs> well, uh, thank you, Andy. Thank, thank you for you being so here. Pleasure is mine. Have me back anytime. I'd love to love to come Yo, back. James Bond. With you. Thank you, James Bond, <laughs> for, for speaking with us. You got it. Look forward to picking up where we left off. Uh, look forward to coming back again real soon. In the meantime, happy Thanksgiving to you both and to your family. And uh, stay well. And uh, everyone out there, stay well. Happy Thanksgiving. Look forward to catching up with you soon. Thank, no, you. thank you. Have a great one, Andy. See you yeah. guys next week. Bye, guys. Bye. Thank you.